Hey everybody, it's David Gordon from Theater Mania here. It's Friday, May 8th. Uh, we made it to Friday. <laughs> Feels different now, I guess. But uh, I'm here today with Irene Sankoff and David Hine, the writers of Come From Away, uh, mm -hmm. a musical that prior to March 12th had been taking the entire world by storm uh, and is now on pause before it returns whenever theater comes back. Uh, so you had the Broadway production, London was up and running. Yeah. Where, else, where else is it? We had the North American tour, uh, Australia and Toronto, and it was, it was doing great. We would have been in China right now, and, and also there was a license in Argentina and Buenos Aires. What, uh, what is that like for you, coming, coming from this as like a little musical that could when it first opened? <laughs> <laughs> see it literally all around the world and in China and to almost see it in China. It's insane. It's insane. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it blows our mind. I mean, every step of the way, we were just so thankful to get uh, as far as we had. We were kind of like blown away by it each step of the way. So it just, it never stopped being amazing. And it's, it's, you know, now we're kind of taking a breath and being like, wow, like that, that actually happened, you know, <laughs> and probably like a lot of people, like a lot of memories are trying to come back because we actually have time to sit. Yeah. A little bit. We do have a six-year-old, so sometimes I'm sitting and zoning out during her homeschooling. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. It's it's been an amazing ride. And at the same time, it's it's um, it's kind of awful in that in that we have uh, this incredible extended uh, come from away family around the world who you know in an instant were out of work, and mm -hmm. so we're trying to stay in touch with them and make sure that um, we support Broadway Caris and Actors Fund and and everything, and make sure that. Um, we can help get back as soon as possible. Yeah, I wanna, I had Kalella on last week. Yay. And she's the, I love her, I love her so much. Yeah. I love everybody in your show. Your show is about like kindness and nice people and at least the Broadway cast, which is the one that I have the most and only real experience with, uh, is just filled with nice kind people who like love the show and have been doing the show for a really long time. Yeah. yeah. We were just yeah. we were just giving um, uh, audition advice to a to a theater class uh, yesterday, yeah. and and one of the things that we said is you know in our audition room we have a no jerks policy that we always uh, we try to make sure that everyone is nice and they'll be part of the community and it's um, and it's paid off. We have this amazing family that continues to not only be amazing on stage but also amazing off stage doing acts of kindness and even in the middle of this doing acts of kindness around the world. So it's it's fantastic. They're great. Take me back. When did you first discover this story? And what made you say, oh, there's a musical or something in that? <laughs> so we actually lived in Manhattan on September 11th. And uh, this, this, we had sort of heard that planes had, had landed in Canada and people would thank us. And we're like, OK, but we're here. Like, we, <laughs> yes, I'm glad our country took planes, but we didn't actually personally have anything to do with it. <laughs> Uh, and then somehow, much like everybody else, our focus was uh, in New York and Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C. And it wasn't until um, a decade later that uh, a friend of ours brought this story to our attention again and said, I'd like to make this into a musical. We're kind of like, oh, oh, the international people coming together like we did at our international student residence in New York. It, it sounded familiar to us. So we applied for a grant. And we flew out there and I was sure that it needed to be something more like Laramie Project. Like it needed to be, like there's just so much to tell mm -hmm. um, that I was like, I don't, I don't think we can stop. I'm like, sing a song about one person. Like this needs to move. I don't think it can be a musical. Yeah, but I, I'd grown up on Newfoundland music and I, I knew that it was, I mean, not only is it this amazing music that's never been heard on Broadway, but uh, it's, uh, it's the way it's baked into the DNA of the people out there. So when we went out there, like literally every interview we had, people would be telling us their stories and then they'd be like, hold on, let me pull out a mandolin for a second, you know? <laughs> and, and you yeah. realize that this is, you know, it's how they take care of people. It's how they take care of each other. It's how they get through their their terrible winters. Uh, so, so they will bring their instruments because everyone plays an instrument over to each other's homes and they sing songs and they tell stories to survive, to get through the winter together as a community. And so this, very quickly that became sort of the model, this kitchen party atmosphere. We were gonna, we were gonna survive together and come together as a community and go through the story together. How much research did you do? Like how many people did you end up talking to? It's, a, it's impossible to say because well, we were out there for three weeks uh, and we were unemployed and didn't have a kid at the time. So we just had all the time in the world and we just 
talk to everybody, you know, like, like just talking to a waitress, sometimes something would end up in the play. Um, and we were living with um, some people because Newfoundland, they were like, well, why don't you just stay with us? And we're like, okay, don't tell my mom because that's going to really make her nervous. <laughs> and, they, and they literally left and just gave yeah. us the keys. They were like, feed the cats, but we'd still like have dinners with them. And, yeah. and, and, and so, and they'd bring their family over and we'd meet everyone in the neighborhood and everyone had a different story. So we came back with it. I mean, we joke about it, but there was 7,000 people who landed there and 9,000 people in town. So we joke about coming back with 16,000 stories that we had to fit into a hundred minute musical. Yeah. Yeah. But you probably did come back with 16,000 stories. It's probably not even a joke. You probably <laughs> Yeah, well, we I remember we like photocopied, we went to the library and all of the letters that had been sent back from people saying thank you, we photocopied every single one. We found every, we found all of these web groups of people who had been stranded in Newfoundland. So we read every comment and uh, like we, we just uh, tried to immerse ourselves and get every possible thing that we could and wanted to put it all on the show. Yeah. Uh, I should say to the people watching, if you have questions for Irene and David, pop them in the comments, we'll get to them. Uh, so tell me about like the writing, you've finally done all these interviews. Tell me about then the writing process. How do you, how do you decide, okay, this story stays, this story goes, oh, this is too good to not include and, you know, go on, so on. You know, that's interesting. There were some things that were, this is going to sound weird, but were too good to include because yeah. you wouldn't yeah. believe them. Right. Like, but with the wish, uh, with the make a wish kids and, uh, everything that the town did for them. I was, people are like, it, it's crazy, right? Like you, you, we, we see the most insanely awful things and we're surprised by them, but we're kind of used to it. But like, if we had included like just how wonderful they were to the wish kids, um, and a couple of other stories, people would have been like, Oh, come on. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's really kind of sad, but, uh, yeah, so some things were too good to include, and um, we tried to put in almost everything. Yeah, really. Yeah. But, Even the wish kids, we yeah. gave them, we we gave them like you know like yeah little lines, little li you know like that's. Yeah. I think I think what helped us was finding finding the characters who really changed during the story. So and characters that had a beginning, middle, and end, and and we we sort of um, we arranged those as our spines, our spine characters that we could work through, and then we clumped all of these anecdotal stories together and stories about food and stories about faith and stories about um, uh, love or, you know, all of those and tried to string them along that spine. And then still, you know, it was a really organic process. We, we pretty much threw out a lot of the rules of musical theater and we just, you know, what was the next thing we wanted to talk about? What would, had we checked in with that character in enough time? Had, you know, did, yeah. we, did we need to, how did we weave it in together? And, and instead I, of the music slowing us down, how did we use it to propel us between um, situations and scenes so that we could get in as much as possible? Yeah. My favorite part of the whole process when the show was opening on Broadway was talking to the real Captain Beverly Bass and Nick and Diane and seeing right. all of those people like come see the show and like worship the show and mm -hmm. like just sob knowing. Colella told a story last week about... Uh, Beverly, not he like hearing me in the sky for the first time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was in La Jolla. She came. She came to see it, and uh, I, I'm sure she told you the story. But but she came to a party the night before, and she was she was she introduced herself to Jen. She introduced herself to everyone, and she started telling these stories. And everyone was like, like it was like verbatim the show coming out of her mouth. And everyone was like, you don't say, really, fascinating. And and then and then she saw it and. Because we, we watch all of them. They come to see the show and we I watch them. I don't watch them. I'm just like, ah. Right. But we stand at the back of the house and we I stare at the back of their head, just like praying that they will say we got it right, that we did it them well. And and she just sobbed and Tom held her. And, and you know, fortunately, she's been back, you know, almost 200 times now to see it. So, yeah. you know, it's better now, but she still cries. Yeah. Uh, how much did the show evolve from La Jolla to Broadway? Because you did a lot of out-of-town stops. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was such a gift that our producers gave us that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, how should it evolve? Uh, it lost one song. It gained a song. Um, uh, we so when we first started uh, with the students at Sheridan at a good speed, we had an intermission, so it lost the intermission. Um, and that was the first workshop we did uh, yeah. with Junkyard Dog Productions, and uh, you know it, it tightened. And, and we further amalgamated characters. Um, 
by if if you look at the early early stuff, like it, it's it's still there. Like like the opening number is the same pretty much, except for like we rearranged. Yeah, yeah. Although all a lot uh, we so in La Jolla we um uh, we added an opening number which we completely staged and uh, and lit and choreographed and everything, and then we got right to the point where Chris said to us. Um, well, we did this all. I mean, should we show it to an audience, even if we're not sure about it? And we were like, no, we don't like it. We want to go back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so a, a lot of, uh, I think the early instincts and the early drive to just tell the story and tell it theatrically and um, uh, have kept the same, but we really tried to compress and cut and tweak and any notes that we got. I, I remember Beverly gave us like one small note in me in the sky that the order wasn't quite right. So we- Yeah, we, yeah, we, we screwed up how you become a pilot. <laughs> She has to fix that. Yeah. 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 Uh I wanna post a question from Julie Gallup, who's watching at home. What is your favorite moment in the show? Um uh, so I'll I'll give mine uh, and and uh so uh I love uh, and it's kind of a sad moment, but I love the moment when uh when Bonnie says goodbye to the animals um mm. and she's saying goodbye to Anga and she says, I'm sorry you lost your baby. Uh and she, it's this moment, it, you know, it's, it's this show that we've, uh, that is set in the backdrop of 9-11. Obviously it's a 9-12 show and it's about what happened in Newfoundland, but still everyone has it present in their minds. And the entire audience still at that moment um, gasps. There's this intake of breath and um, there's this feeling, you know, sadness for, for the baby of this, of this animal that we haven't even seen on stage. And I, I think it's, it's this testament, not only to the theatricality uh, of, of the piece that it, that it's become real, that the actors have brought uh, us on, but also that we've gone on this journey and, and that we're still human at the end of this, even in the shadow of this tragedy, we, we can still feel for that uh, collectively. And, and there's something really powerful about that for me that, that it's become real for everyone. And, and we're doing it together. I think for me, and it always kind of shifts, it always changes. Um, I love it when uh, the cardiologists come on, when, when um, Annette conjures a cardiologist. Mm, why do you love like, that? No, yeah, <laughs> when it was my idea. <laughs> um, also, just, they're hot cardiologists. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what it's like in my head, like all the time. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, good, you know, the mailman's here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. Okay, anyway, so. Quarantine yeah. brain. Yeah, <laughs> quarantine brain. Um, but just because it, from improv training, it's always like, um, oh, you know, let's let's cut to that. Let's go to that. Let's show that. Let's let's show what's happening. And there was uh, many more moments like that that, <laughs> that got lost, rightly so. Yeah. But um, I love that we kept that one. Um, and it's yeah, always in writing. It, it's always hard to be like, oh, this person is thinking this. Oh, can we just see it? Can we just see what it looks like? But yeah. Were you? Because this was your first Broadway show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you've had you'd had shows in New York before, and you'd had right one show. Yeah, this was our Comfort Way is our second show. Our first show is called My Mother's Lesbian Jewish Wiccan Wedding, which is a true story about my mom mm -hmm. and how she came out to me, how she discovered her sexuality and rediscovered her Jewish faith and fell in love with a Wiccan woman. And uh, it's it's done well for us. Uh, it, it we we originally put it on as a way just to spend time together. We we thought let's write a musical this summer. And we had never written one before. And we put it on in the Toronto Fringe in this little ABC theater venue. And the biggest Canadian producer, the Mervishes, came to see it. And they picked it up and took it to an 700-seat theater. And we had to quit our day jobs because we were performing it and writing it. And um, and so this is our second show. Yeah. But we did bring it down to New York for the, uh, for the, the Nymph, Nymph Festival. Festival. Yeah. 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 And it was a wonderful experience. We met a lot of friends there. and. Um, and uh, it did it did really well there too, and continues to play and do well. Did you when Come From Away was first opening several years ago? Did you ever like walk down the street and be like, "Oh, this is my show. My name's on a Broadway theater." Like, did you ever have like the freak out of, "Oh my god, my show is about to open on Broadway"? Yes. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I, I think it was nicely scaffolded for us though, like with La Jolla and with Seattle and. DC and, and you know Toronto because that's uh, where I'm from anyway and it just I'm you know looking at a theater that I've been in a million times and then my show was going up in it but 
Yeah, like the freak out was kind of continual. Like, I mean, I, even before we went to La Jolla, I would wake up in the middle of the night and be like, we can't go to La Jolla. We can't take a show to La Jolla. Who does that? We don't do that. But there, we did it. Yeah. But that's not to say that we did not freak out completely on Broadway. Like, I, just, I, I was I'm constantly in a state of freak out. So, yeah. I remember running in and we like ran me and uh, Rodney yeah, ran right. all over the theater, like taking videos and like going out yeah. on the balcony where we're not supposed yeah, to go and, and look at the and signs and, like, don't ever and looking for like the pictures. secret entrances yeah. between the theaters that connect them yeah. all. And yeah, we're totally geeking out. That's awesome. And what, tell me about the international experience. It's not Canada, obviously, but like London and Australia. Uh, what are audiences like there and how are they responding to the show? Uh, remarkably similar, despite being so far away and uh, having different sensibilities. Um, the the people in London are were like probably like the most off the hook crazy for the show, or maybe yeah. like comparing it to what like people in London are generally a little more subdued. Yeah, um, it was it, wow. it, Yeah, but it's a weird thing. Like it, the further we get away from you know where from the, Newfoundland, it, or the, from like, from, the yeah. bigger the response seems to be, which uh, is not what we could have predicted. And that's and that's saying something because, I mean, we've been really lucky that uh, it's partly because we don't let people clap very much during the show, but right. but also we get, we've been really lucky that ever since the first workshop, knock on wood, that we get a standing ovation every night around the world. And I, I think that that's because it's for the people of Newfoundland. It's for yeah. the people, it's for the story and the kindness that they gave and feels uh, feels like, you know, certainly when we opened in 2017, uh, kindness was needed and people wanted to remember that there's goodness in the world. And right now it's more, you know, even though we can't um, connect uh, except, uh, you know, online, we there's this need to remember that we can come together in response to these things, whether it's online or, or off. And I think that story still resonates. Yeah, I've already decided that I want to come from a way to be my first show once theaters reopen. Just you know, just to see just to see the kindness on display. Yeah, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a party. It's it's gonna be incredible. And I don't know, there's something like I, I remember when we lived in New York on on 9-11, you know, the power of theater to come back. We we were both working on shows, not on Broadway at all, but um, but small shows, and we expected them to be empty. And people came back after that. And it was quieter, but they just wanted to be together. We want to be together as a as a community. We wanted, you know, there's that wonderful story. I don't know that you saw where you know your heartbeats sync with people in the same. Yeah. Story. And I think we want that. We want to, uh, you know, and see stories about that. And so I, I can't wait. Our cow, our company can't wait. We we want you know we want to be back as soon as possible and as safely as possible while we still take care of everyone. Uh, was it an intentional decision on your part, or was it? Chris Ashley that decided uh, the few applause breaks. You had mentioned that before that you don't let the audience clap very much. And I want to know how that idea came to fruition. When we were first working on it, uh, we, we thought it seemed strange to applaud for, um, you know, people doing good things like it, it, it just it just seemed kind of like, you know, after blankets and bedding, like, look, we got all of the stuff. Ta -da. Like it just, it didn't seem yeah. to make sense. And then, you know, after Hannah's number, um, you know, like, oh, you're, you're, you're worried about your son. Let's, it just, it, it, we wanted it to move more like a play. Yeah. Um, There's something about putting buttons on the end of each song that felt, it just didn't feel natural. The, the songs were so truthful and had come from people's verbatim and they didn't stop in them. Like, unless they were telling a joke and, and waiting for laughter, they weren't, you know, doing that, you yeah. know, it, it, yeah. it it just felt strange. And Chris, Chris really dove into that. And he's, um, he's, he's militant about it. <laughs> yeah. So, so at, at the end of me in the sky, uh, the actress playing Janice is instructed to drive through, do not let the audience clap because it, yeah. it pulls us out. It says, it says that's an actor on stage and, and that's not what we want with the show. We want to say, come with us to Newfoundland and be with us in this moment. And we'll get to the point where we can all celebrate kindness at the end. But we're not going to stop in the middle to to I mean you know, we and we should be celebrating the actors because they're brilliant and yeah know, doing on stage is amazing. But we'll get there. And right now, let's tell the story. I think that's the first time I've ever seen a choice like that where you guys deliberately don't let the audience applaud for 
what's ostensibly the 11 o'clock number. And I remember thinking how badass that it was. <laughs> yeah, Lin- Lin-Manuel Miranda came to see the show and the first, the thing, first he, thing he said to us was- He was like, there's no buttons. And we were- And I was like, what the, what? <laughs> <laughs> but then he was, he was like, it's ruthless what you guys do to the audience. <laughs> uh, what was the hardest song to write? Oh gosh, uh, Hannah's number. Uh, that, was number. The, that was the latest yeah, one. Yeah, that was the latest one. But we it, it came fast. It. When, it, when it happened, it happened quickly. We but... hadn't we hadn't talked to Hannah. We hadn't met her personally, so we, we felt you know something about getting to meet the people and having the permission to tell their story. That it took meeting her and meeting her family and meeting um, uh, her son's uh, grandson her, uh, and namesake and and. Uh, getting the family's permission that that gave us a lot. Yeah, yeah, we had like a really magical uh, afternoon with them out in Long Island, and uh, uh, I don't know, just just somehow after that. Uh, okay, it's kind of like a trippy story, but um, yeah. <laughs> but we as we were leaving, it was just before Christmas, and. Um, his, 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 it was his widow. Yeah, it was Marianne. And Marianne uh, dropped us at the train station, and uh, these big snowflakes started to fall, and there was carolers holding candles. That just and, came out of nowhere, and, and we suddenly. Yeah, so, and we had our daughter who had been oh, playing yes, with, his, yes, with, very his, important. with his yeah. grandson. And we were waiting for the train. We had 10 minutes. And suddenly these carolers started singing just as the snow started falling. They all had candles. And we walked over there. And suddenly a fire engine pulled up at the edge of the park. Like, like rearing. And, this, like and this was after we had just been with this firefighting family yeah, talking, telling in the us park all about where Kevin. he has a memorial. And, s- the and Santa Claus got out of the fire engine <laughs> and came to a pavilion in the middle of all of these carolers and picked our daughter, picked Molly to come up and take this beautiful bear, right, white, tiny bear. pristine bear. And it, it was just this beautiful- It was this like, weird feeling of, I think we have permission. I think I think we need to do yeah. this now. And it was in the park yeah. where Kevin's memorial was. And yeah. so it, um, anyway, so that that was one of the, the song came quickly after that. Yeah, oh, I love that. That's wild. Yeah, yeah, it was wild, it was wild. Yeah. Uh, getting a lot of comments here about the applause. The inability to applaud makes the audience emotions build up inside. So at the end, we just burst. Yeah, you went. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you guys working on a movie version of it, or is there is there any progress yeah. on that? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything to hear? as much as there is to hear about it? Right. You know, sadly, but we're we're plugging away at it. We're uh, nobody wants us to slow down working on it. I think people are excited to get back to work once they can safely do so. And um, they they want it ready. Yeah, and so. excited to bring Newfoundland to even more audiences. You know, it's already been incredible, but. You know, if we can bring the story to even more people and hopefully help the story inspire people, then, then that's all the good. Yeah. And and you can film it there too. If they can if they can house thirty eight planes of people, they'll be able to house a film crew. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the dream. I mean, we've yeah. always wanted to give back in lots of ways. So if we can give back to the economy by sending the tourists there, and if we can give back by bringing a film crew there, who also I think that, you know there's something magical about being there our cast saw it when we when we took the show there for our benefit concerts and it it makes it real and also you literally get invited into it's, everyone's it's house and fanned into nonstop. Like, they're gonna yeah. need to plan for an extra three weeks yeah. because of all of the dinners and people will get married yeah, yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be off the hook yeah what um yeah tell me about the reaction in newfoundland during that concert because wasn't it on like an ice hockey rink or something yeah i was in the world's largest walk-in refrigerator from the show <laughs> Yeah, it was um, like literally a- a- anyone from the show will tell you it. Uh, first of all, there's not a word to describe what it was, what it was like for us. Uh, yeah. But life changing. Everyone brings that up because it was, it was so good. We were so scared about it. We were so scared. <laughs> all, all the cast was terrified that their accents weren't weren't right. And but, but beyond that, we just you know we were used to seeing Beverly Bass in the audience and just worrying about her this was 5000 people coming to see the show half the town and it was their and, story and, and it's, it's the people who did it you know what i mean it's the people who uh either we spoke to directly or um you know one woman came up to me afterwards and said i was the one that put the out of order signs on the phones that you mentioned oh. it's like oh so great to meet you <laughs> you know it was yeah and then and so uh, i remember uh, lee tells this story about being backstage and the actors were so good they they, they were like our job is just to tell the story we're not going to cry we're not going to be emotional just go out and tell the story 
and uh, and they came out and in the opening number they started singing I'm an Islander and over and over and the and these thousands of Newfoundlanders started cheering at the top of their lungs and the entire cast just went <laughs> just burst into tears and we burst into tears and yeah it was yeah. so good Caesar said I looked like a turtle trying to like <laughs> 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 from stage i was like thanks yeah yeah it was the best it was it, that's all we ever wanted we never we never imagined and we never you know it wasn't it wasn't even in our dreams that we would go to broadway or go around the world but we just wanted them to say we got it right and so that's yeah that meant the world to us and i think that is a beautiful and poetic place to say thank you so much for doing this of course uh, i really appreciate your time uh I'm going to play a video that you guys recorded for us and we shared on social media. Uh, it is a video of the two of you performing Me in the Sky uh, on ukulele. There's a little intro to it. Uh, so I'm gonna play that to play us out. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks everybody for watching today and this week. Uh, we're back on Monday at two with Andre DeShield from Hadestown. Uh, and uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Be good. Thanks everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm David Hine. And I'm Irene Sankoff. And we're the writers of Come From Away. We just drove back to Canada with our kid and our two cats in a car. Uh, so we didn't have room for a guitar, but we did have room for a ukulele. So this is Me in the Sky on ukulele. My parents must have thought they had a crazy kid. Cause I was one of those kids Who always knew what I wanted They took me down to the airport To see all the planes departing Watching them fly Something inside of me was starting I was eight when I told them That I'd be a pilot But I was too young and too short And there were no female captains And my dad said Be patient, Bev just see what happens. But I took my first lesson, came down from the sky, and told my father I'd fly for the rest of my life. And I got my first job, flying for a mortician in a tiny bonanza, just a corpse and me. Five dollars an hour for flying dead bodies. I had to climb over their faces just to get to my seat. And suddenly,
Mais 